Hey, Redcon Raider here. Before we get started, I'd just like to thank the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible. With special thanks to Revenant, a nerd in war paint, Antonio Hernandez, Matthew Holmquist, Nathan Welch Jr., and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. Never thought I'd get so close to the embassies. Look at the size of this council hall. So, this is what they spend our taxes on. Look, is that the princess? Wait, is she leaving? Apparently so. Then who will administer the oath? The maid who empties her chamber pot? No, we're not as important as that. Perhaps her stable boy. You thought it would be the princess? If she rules the whole principality, who's more important? Lady Keen, the council's oath keeper, is trusted by all. Lord Caron. Yes, my lady. Are these your new deputies? They are, my lady. My name is Lyra Keen, oath keeper of the council. Shh. Quiet, everyone. And I will be administering your vows. Once sworn in, you will carry the authority of the Council wherever you go. Your every action will reflect upon the Council's reputation. Remember that. Always. Now, please, raise your right hands. Do you, each and all, solemnly swear your lives and allegiance to this Council and promise to carry forth our mission to protect our alliance from any who would threaten the common good. I, I swear. swear. Excellent. Lord Caron will enter your name into the Council's register. Thank you for your service. Congratulations, deputies. Wait, that's it? What were you expecting? A parade? No, I don't know. It just feels a bit... anticlimactic. Sorry to disappoint. So, the mission. As I'm sure you know, the Council maintains a number of outposts to secure the border between the Principality and the Marches. One of them is the former Imperial Fortress, KLM. It's held by some 50 troops under the command of Captain Henrik. He sends us weekly status reports, or rather, he used to. We haven't heard a word from him in three weeks. Leave immediately for KLM and find out if anyone there is still alive. If Captain Henrik or anyone else is still breathing, Bring him back. The Council wants a first-hand report. A whole garrison gone. There are only four of us. Just find out what happened. Run back if you get scared. Got it. Though we were hoping for a first mission with more riches than risk, if you catch my drift. You don't get to choose your mission, I'm afraid. So, gather what you need and go. Time is of the essence. Wait. These marches. They're not in the Badlands, are they? The marches are a no-man's land, between the civilized world and the Badlands. It's outside the chain of mountains that really define the Badlands. We wouldn't send you in there. Yet. Very reassuring. Thank you. What can you tell us about this, Captain Henrik? A fine officer more than 15 years in the Principality's army. He inspires trust, loyalty, and courage. Hence the decision to post him there, facing danger. Right, I guess that's that. It's on to Care Lem. Hmm. It's interesting, watching those conversations play out. I'm so used to uh, having to give voice to our lades that uh, it definitely takes some getting used to. It's actually a big part of the reason I didn't interject a customary ret or retcon character, since uh, the characters largely speak for themselves. Anyway, uh, welcome back to uh, Solasta, Crown of the Magister. Obviously, uh, I have taken the liberty of scooting us ahead just a bit, to get things moving. We do actually still have a fair number of folks scattered around town that, in theory, we could spend time talking with, 
But I'm gonna try to speed through this whole town segment, so we can actually get on with the real adventuring. The faction system means that, um, for the most part, while we could go and talk to various characters, most of them won't even give us the time of day, because we're still relative unknowns. A lot of these characters are just, um, glorified merchants, anyway. They basically provide specialty goods once you exceed a certain amount of reputation with their respective faction. Which, again, is something that we'll uh, get to a bit later down the line. What's up, buddy? Go get yourself killed in the Badlands. Cool. Nice, nice to see you too. Hello, adventurers. What can I offer you? <laughs> Henrik, Master of Diplomacy. Tell us about your tavern. The inn? Well, it's not that old, but somehow it feels like it's been here forever. Well, you can meet all kinds of people here, that's the good thing. An old scavenger, a diplomat from the council, a knight, a lord, a beggar. We also have rooms to rent by the night. Why the name Grave Keeps Cask? Well, it's very old from imperial times. Perhaps a historian would know, but I don't. I was kind of expecting an amusing anecdote, but... Okay. We'll just move things along. We'd like to stay for the night. Sure. Just walk up to the suite and settle in. A suite? Oh, it's more like a large bedroom, really. But you know, this is the capital city. Great. Way to uh, justify that 10 gold piece price tag. Let's take care of these level ups, shall we? Let me just grab my notes. Alright, so first up we've got your breath. Pretty straightforward. Fighting style will of course be two weapon. That will allow her to add her strength bonus to the damage on her offhand attacks. Only plus three at the moment, but I do plan on bumping her up to 18 strength uh, once she hits level four. Then we've got her spells, and it really comes down to whether we want to focus on healing, mobility, or even a bit of offense. Um, though I do think that Hunter's Mark is more useful to a ranger who is not focused on offhand attacks, because it requires your bonus actions to actually cast and reassign the target for Hunter's Mark, which means she'd be forgoing her offhand attack every time she does it. I think if we had made her a more stereotypical bow-based ranger, then Hunter's Mark would be a shoe in She would have nothing else to use her bonus actions on. But as it currently stands, I think we're going to lean more towards a blend of healing and mobility, just to uh, make up for her own lower movement and the fact that we only have one other primary healer in the party. Long stride is probably more practical than jump. But jump is a whole lot more fun, so I think we're going to go for that one. We might grab long stride at level 3, though. One final note. Um, I almost went with Goodberry because it looks pretty good on paper, but in actual execution, it requires a whole lot of micromanagement. Every berry is essentially a healing potion and has to be used individually. Not ideal. Next we've got Henrik. Again, fairly straightforward. More hit points, more spell slots, and the ability to channel divinity, which allows him to turn undead or to cast foreknowledge, which makes him a whole lot harder to hit but only for the next 10 combat rounds, and only for the first attack against him each round. Next we have Istvan. 
more hit points, an arcane tradition, more spells and spell slots, plus arcane recovery, which lets him recover a small number of spells when he takes a short rest. Only one per day at the moment, but still. As for our arcane tradition, I didn't actually have any of these in mind when I first built the character, and I find all three of them appealing for various different reasons. Green Mage, for example, would essentially transform him into a hybrid Ranger Mage, uh, granting him access to most of the Ranger's low-level spell list, while also making him proficient with leather armor and short bows, and if I'm reading this right, also giving him a plus two to hit with bows. If I had planned around that, I might have made him a Sylvan Elf, just so he'd have the um, longbow proficiency. That, I think, would have maximized this particular hybrid class. But as it currently stands, I think he's better off sticking with just um, mage armor and flame bolts. On a similar note, I do find the Loremaster tradition very appealing as well, uh, maybe even more appealing than the Green Mage, because I like to focus on both skills and crafting, and this grants advantage with both. But, again, I did not build him with that in mind. I feel like we've already got most of our skills covered, and he would only get partial benefit from those crafting bonuses, because I did not make him proficient with the Herbalist's kit. That aside, um, he wouldn't have access to most of the spells you need to craft magic potions anyway, because a lot of those require clerical spells. I suppose he would still gain some benefit from the scribing and scroll crafting side of being a lore master, but even there, it is important to note that your big limiting factor when you're crafting scrolls is not going to be the gold cost. It's going to be how limited the actual crafting ingredients are. As it currently stands, I just don't think there's enough benefit here to justify taking lore master. Not for Istvan. Which, I suppose, really just leaves us with the uh, Shock Arcanist. Uh, that one is your pretty standard Battle Mage package. Uh, essentially, every single purely offensive spell on his roster, the ones on the War list, will be cast as if they were one level slot higher than they actually are. In the short term, that's only going to cover spells like Burning Hands, Magic Missile, and Thunder Wave. But at higher levels, it'll also cover spells like Fireball and Lightning Bolt which can become pretty incredible. So, yeah, we'll uh, run with that one. Of course, if we are indeed going to uh, start leaning him towards battle magic, I suppose we should revise his spellbook somewhat with some more appropriate spells. We don't have Burning Hands or Thunder Wave, so we definitely need to pick up at least one of those, but it is worth noting that we only have one new slot this level, and the slots that he has are already hotly contested for other various utility and defensive spells. I think what we're going to do is go ahead and grab Detect Magic, because that's a nice utility spell, and this will save us the trouble of trying to find a scroll for it. And then we'll also take... Let's say... Thunder Wave. Both Burning Hands and Thunder Wave are close-range crowd control spells, but I feel like if enemies are already close enough to be within range of either of those spells, you're probably going to want to go with the spell that will also knock those enemies away from you. Which, finally, brings us to Sir Dialot, who, mercifully, has a much more straightforward level up. Aside from more hit points, he also picks up the Cunning Action ability, which greatly expands the utility of his bonus actions. In this particular case, since we already know he's going to be crossbow-focused, it essentially means that he can now use hit-and-run tactics, sprinting up, firing, and then using his bonus action to dash back to safety. Now we just need to set our spell slots... Henrik is obviously our primary healer, so right off the bat, that is Cure Wounds and Healing Word. 
You'll notice that because of his insight domain, he already has identify and detect evil on his list. That's handy. So we'll go ahead and supplement that with detect magic. Then I guess we'll round him out with some nice support spells. Let's say guiding bolt to mark targets. And um, then I guess we'll grab bless and shield of faith. They're both concentration spells, so he'll only be able to maintain one at a time. But this way he will be able to choose between bolstering our offense or our defense. Always nice to have some uh, tactical versatility. And now for Istvan spell slots. Let's say Mage Armor and Shield for defensive purposes. Jump for mobility and utility. And then I guess we will go with Mage Armor, Sleep, and Thunder Wave for offense. All right, moving on. I've got to say, I am somewhat surprised that they hit us with a level up so quickly. Last I checked, the planned level cap was level 10, but they may have changed that since uh, the original crowdfunder. At any rate, now that we have that done, it's time to finish preparations for our journey, which is going to take us to Market Street. Ah, right. This is the crafting vendor. You know, this does get pretty involved, so um, let's just speed through this part real quick. We'll have a chat with this vendor, and then we'll have a peek at crafting. I think that's one of those things that's going to be a lot easier to show rather than tell. Hello. How may I help you? Magic, please. What do you sell here? Mostly potions for heroic adventurers like yourselves. I also have recipes for customers who like to craft their own. And ingredients, too. Even rare flowers from the Badlands. Come back any time. I'm almost always open. Okay, so first things first, let's go ahead and unload some of this vendor trash we've accumulated. Now, um, I think one of the big things you're going to notice here is that the vast majority of the gear we're looking at is marked as not available. That's one of the main elements of the in-game faction system. As you uh, accumulate more reputation, various faction vendors, in this case the Principality of Mazgarth, will offer a higher quality variety of goods. Different factions will have different areas of expertise, so it's ultimately up to the player to decide what type of goods they want to prioritize gaining access to. Of course, in this case, the uh, Principality of Mazgarth are our primary employers, so short of betraying them or just completely botching the missions they send us on, we should naturally accumulate reputation with them over time. We'll have to pick and choose, though, when it comes to some of the other factions, because we'll often find ourselves in possession of items that multiple factions want, but that only one will end up getting. Ah, crafting ingredients. I do want to start crafting something. I just don't know what we actually need yet. Alright, let's have a look. This, of course, is our crafting screen. Pretty straightforward. It lists the four different categories of items that we can craft, which of those crafting kits we are proficient with, and what recipes we've unlocked for each of those four categories. In this particular case, uh, Yavreth obviously is more about destroying than crafting, because she is not proficient with any of these. 
But then if we look at the rest of the party, Henrik is proficient with herbalism kits and scroll kits. Though it is worth noting that um, just because he's proficient with a kit doesn't mean that he's going to be great at it. Uh, he also cannot enchant items. But you'll notice that um, while he is not proficient with a poisoner's kit, he does actually have several of the supporting skills, so he can kind of fake it. He just won't do it as well as a character who actually knows what they're doing. Then we've got Istvan, who is also proficient with the scroll kit and can kind of fake it with potion brewing. And uh, he is actually proficient with the mana call and rosary, the enchanting kit. We just don't have one of those rosaries. In the previous build, those things were almost impossible to find. But uh, I have heard that they made them slightly easier to find in the winter update. We'll have to uh, keep an eye out and see if we can actually get our hands on one. Then we've got Sir Dialot, who is, of course, our primary poison crafter. Unfortunately, he is slightly handicapped by the fact that uh, medicine is not on the rogue's skill list, so he had to do without it. But we are going to be giving him a poison-centric subclass, so that should hopefully make up for the lack of medicine. Now, let's see here. I would like to get us started on crafting something. Huh, that's strange. For some reason, it's saying that Henrik doesn't meet the prerequisite for cure wounds, which we literally just set on his prepared spell list. That's weird. That's got to be a bug. I'll have to look into it a bit later, see if I can find some way to work around that. Oh, yeah, yeah, see, um, Yvreth does meet that prerequisite, but unfortunately she is not proficient with making potions, so that doesn't really help us there. All right, well, this is an early access build. Um, like I said, I'll see if I can find a workaround on that. But in the meantime, let's get started on a basic scroll or two. I would like to start brewing some basic poison as well, but... That requires Skarn Powder, and I don't believe the general goods vendor actually carries that. We'll just have to scrounge some up ourselves. I'm actually tempted to load up on other ingredients while we're here, but I suppose I should really restrain myself. There we go. Crafting underway. As it states there, it will take him eight successes to actually put that thing together. And I believe he makes one skill check every hour. So the bulk of the work is going to be done while we're traveling on the world map. Or while we're camping. Welcome to Gorim's Emporium. Are you Gorim? That's me, the one and only. Good story. What do you have to sell? Everything you'll need for going out there into the Badlands. Food, ropes, torches, and of course, armor and weapons. I also have some other stock like remedies and antitoxins. That can come in handy. Ever heard of deep spiders? Indeed I have. I believe those are our primary source of Skarn powder. So I look forward to meeting some. Weapons. No heavy crossbow. We'll have to find one for Sir Elsewhere. We could pick up some scimitars as backup weapons for your breath. Oh, you know what? Let's go ahead and grab some 
extra stacks of crossbow bolts. We're going to be burning through those things pretty quick, and there's no guarantee we'll find more out in the wild. Basic armor. Nothing we really need here. Though we will eventually want to upgrade Henrik and Yavreth to half plate, which I thought was heavy armor. Hmm. I guess that must have changed in 5th edition. Oh, Manicol and Rosary. Wow, they did make it easier to find. I, I mean, it's right here in the general goods vendor's inventory, so I'd say that's about as easy as you could possibly make it. Oh man, I really want that. But it is pretty pricey. Ah, what the heck. We can afford it. Let's go ahead and grab one. That way we'll be prepared if and when we find an item that is ready to be enchanted. Oh, wait. <laughs> Hold on. Welcome. I got so excited finding that rosary that uh, I completely forgot why we were actually here. Which is to buy food for our upcoming adventure. There we go. <laughs> now we can go adventuring. I'm glad I uh, restrained myself from buying more crafting ingredients. Otherwise we wouldn't have been able to afford food. That would have been awkward. Deputies, a word if you please. So famous already. Ooh, I love it. You are in there too. Are you a member of the council? I'm Annie Bagmorda, quartermaster of the Scavengers Guild. We don't have a seat in there, but they all know exploring the Badlands without us would be a bad idea. That's why you should stop by our headquarters downtown. You'll need our services, I'm sure. Is that compulsory? No, but you'll find our services useful. Everyone does. Did Lord Karen not tell you? No, he pretty much stuck to giving orders. Oh, right. Anyway, we offer plenty of help and advice to beginners like you. We are grown-ups, you know. At least, uh, most of us are. Of course you are. Well, good luck. They're tough, these scavengers. Fearless. Inviting beggars to the council. How peculiar. I'd rather visit the temple, honestly. So what do you think? Should we check out their headquarters? It's not far, but... I've had enough talking. Let's go kill some monsters. If there's business to be done, we can't afford not to. All right, well, as much as I do sympathize with your breaths and desire to just go kill some monsters, I suppose we should at least pretend we're professionals, as Sir has recommended. Besides, I think we do need to talk to the scavengers if we want to unlock the new party stash mechanic. Ah, you came. You piqued our curiosity. So, what exactly do you have to offer? You don't know. I like that she invites us over here, then immediately gives us attitude. What kind of help do you offer to people like us? Simple. Now, people like you typically carry out missions for the Council, in the marches, even in the Badlands. Sometimes far away, like Captain Merrin. Who's Captain Merrin? You really must be new. She's one of yours. Senior Deputy of the Council. Anyway, you trek out to some old ruin in the Badlands, Kill a bunch of orcs. Well, you're still a bit green, so let's say goblins. Ouch! You're hurting our feelings. Orcs will hurt much more than your feelings, believe me. And stop interrupting, it's rude. So let's say you find yourself with a whole load of rusty swords, leather armor, 
Shields, too much for you to log back here. Oh, so we're puny as well as green. Thanks so much. So instead, you brave heroes just clear the place of monsters and draw us a nice clean map. Then we take our carts and pick up every piece of junk. We bring it back, we sell it, and we split the profits with you. We move the stuff, you go off to kill more bad things, everybody wins. For a percentage, of course. What? You could never carry it all anyway. Not in your little backpacks. Rude. But that said, um, I do actually find the scavenger mechanic fascinating. I'm not sure I've seen something like that in any of the other CRPGs I've played over the past few years. As a uh, consummate pack rat, I do indeed constantly struggle with any game that has a built-in encumbrance system. Overloading my characters is just second nature. But with a system like this, you can actually focus on just taking the most useful and valuable items and then letting the NPCs worry about finding and selling the various garbage items or trash items for you. Pretty handy. Do you sell healing potions? No, we don't. There's a shop for that. Yeah, we're gonna go. Well, thank you. I guess that's it for us. Fine. Feel free to visit us any time. Or drop into any scavenger camp. Are there others? Anywhere we can settle. By the way, if you find Captain Henrik, tell him we're still interested. In what? In getting our people to care Lem. The outpost is perfect for us. Close to the Badlands, with plenty of space for our camp. Right. We'll tell him if we find him. That would be appreciated. The more you do for us, the more we do for you. Oh, so this business relationship can get better. And I hope it will, friend. I guess we'll see you around then. Sure. Good luck out there. And don't forget, in the Badlands, always keep your eyes open. Okay, so uh, not only did that give us access to the scavenger mechanic, but that also unlocked our party's stash and gave us an optional quest objective. So uh, I'd say that was well worth the detour. Unfinished Biography a handwritten handbook, apparently used to draft a biography. The project seems to have been cancelled after just a few lines. Strange. Ah, there we go. That is our party stash. I guess the other one belonged to someone else. Now, I have never actually used this mechanic, but I believe you can store up to 50 items in here and access them here at the town or at any scavenger camp. So it's a nice place to stash extra supplies or components for long-term crafting projects. Now, what is this chest? Captain Marin's stash. Ah, the... Um that's the Deputy Chief of the Legacy Council. Sure. Let's uh, see if we can crack that thing open. Nope, that is not going to do it. Though it does look like he has a 25% chance of success, so... Oh, shoot. Can we... I guess we only got one shot at it. Hmm. Well, that sucks. I wonder if we can uh, try again if we reload into the map. Though, to be fair, I'm assuming that at some point Captain Marin would actually give us the key to the stash as a reward for some side quest or something. All right. Well, as nice as it might have been to get some bonus loot before we embark on our first real adventure, I'm not going to kick up a fuss about it. That aside, I feel like we've already spent more than enough time kicking about town anyway. Let's hit the pause button real quick. Uh, I am going to do one more quick pass around town and go grab another energy drink. 
and we will pick things up once we are out and about. Adventure awaits. We'll be right back. And we are back. As you can see, we are now on the world map. We've got a tutorial pop up, but once again, it's fairly straightforward. As you travel, time will pass. At the end of each day, your characters will stop to rest and consume rations. And whilst they are traveling, they will uh, attempt a variety of passive skill checks, with rewards or penalties being doled out depending on success or failure. It is worth noting that um, it's not really open world. You can only chart a course to a location if you've already been there before, or if someone, as in this case, has told you about it, though you can control the pace of your travel. There might be some cases where it's um, to your benefit to eschew caution and simply rush to your destination as fast as possible, but I have yet to actually encounter a circumstance like that, so I usually go slow and steady. That not only reduces the chance of being ambushed, but also increases our opportunities to gain extra crafting ingredients. One other thing I will note is that, um, despite how large the map is, the main quest actually seems to be fairly linear, and despite all of these locations being marked on the map, we can't actually visit any of them in the current build. I am hoping that as development moves forward, they add a lot more side locations that we can uh, visit or explore. What's here is pretty good. I just like to see more of an open campaign structure. I feel like exploration is a major part of a game like this one, especially when you've got what is a fairly impressive world map system. But I will admit that is more of a personal preference. Some people might prefer a more guided experience. Anyway, let's uh, get back to it. Hmm, travel routine. Ah, right, okay, so sleep schedules and fatigue. That makes sense. Off on the left, you can actually see highlights of their journey. Oh, and we have been ambushed by bandits. Great work, guys. It's your first day on the job. Well, try not to die. Okay, so we were caught by surprise, but we were not sleeping yet, which is a small mercy. I was actually watching the uh, event ticker when that happened, and I think it did just say that we were sitting down for dinner. Oh, and uh, unlike Baldur's Gate 3, Solasta does have a ready action, which I very much appreciate. That gives us a lot more tactical flexibility on the battlefield. Though, unfortunately, in this case, we're surprised, so it's kind of a moot point. Hmm. It actually looks like these guys are all melee opponents, so... They're essentially just using their surprise to close the distance. That actually does give us an adequate chance to fight back. All right, Istvan is up, but he has two bandits going right after him, so we're gonna have to make this good. Thunder Wave is tempting, but I, I'm pretty sure that is an indiscriminate AOE spell. I believe that would blast half our party right into the campfire. Sleep, on the other hand, that does appear to specify that it only affects enemies. So let's give that one a shot. Oh, that is lovely. Sleep. 
Sir is free to move to a more advantageous position. Let's get him up here. I think we have to prioritize the highwaymen. Oh, nice. That actually counted as a sneak attack. I was not expecting that. All right, well, let's uh, have Sir dash farther back. That'll keep him out of melee range, and next turn he can move up onto the tower. Gotta love your breath, talking trash to the one bandit who's still standing. I guess we don't really need to be subtle at this point. We've pretty much won. You should have fled. Yes, that was overkill. And yes, that was entirely in character for Istvan. Really, we could just beat these guys to death, but where's the fun in that? Lovely. Now we can loot these corpses and finish our long rest, which will restore all the spell slots we just burned. Hey, area looting. Nice. That was definitely not present in the previous build. You had to loot each corpse separately. The Long Night. Oh, nice. That's new, too. We'll go ahead and toss that over to Sir Dialot. Ah, I guess he's too far away. That's fine. We'll uh, juggle it in just a moment. In fact... Yeah, we'll just do it this way. This is a lot easier. The uh, area looting is a welcome addition, but it does appear to take each individual character's positioning into account, so something that one character can reach won't necessarily be reachable by another character. Having one person grab everything and then just dole it out afterwards is slightly simpler. Oh, wow. Light encumbrance is minus two speed. You know what? I think we can uh, live without the leather armor. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That keeps us just under those encumbrance limits. Get some rest. You guys have earned it. Onward, my friends. Onward. Nice. One magic missile scroll. I suppose we could immediately start on crafting something new. Ah, there we go. Just had to uh, click on the character icon. Well, 
Oh, shoot. I thought it said we had found more crafting ingredients, but it looks like our big choke points right now are blood daffodils and amaranth. So we will have to hold off on crafting until we find more of that stuff. Hmm. Still not registering cure wounds either. That's annoying. I have been informed, though, that I should try unslotting and reslotting the spell. So we'll try that next time we do a long rest. There's our uh, tutorial for interrupting travel, right after I muddled through figuring it out myself. Good timing. Hey, there's some amaranth. I guess we should uh, really hold on to it for now. I was hoping we could use it to make healing items, but obviously that's not happening at the moment. What we will do, though, is load up on blood daffodils and amaranth when we get back to town. Those seem like pretty crucial crafting ingredients. We're almost there. It's just up the hill. It's a little too quiet, don't you think? All right, we are almost out of time, but... Oh boy, I am not liking the look of that. We've got a single winding path leading up to the fort with a bunch of barricades randomly dotted right at the midpoint. Armor up. Hmm. That actually puts him right on par with Henrik as the uh, highest defense in the party. Not too shabby. In fact, now I actually have some slight concerns about Sir because he only has a 14 AC. Oh, shoot. Shield of Faith only lasts 10 minutes. Oh, but it can be cast as a bonus action. I didn't know that. So we can just cast it on the fly. What's that smell? Ooh, goblins. And there is our obligatory tutorial about cover. Pretty standard. Minus two against half cover, minus five against three quarters cover, and you can't target anyone behind full cover. Noted. And some stuff about inventory management and utility slots. I think we get the idea. Let's kill some monsters. All of these guys are going to have height advantage on us. Let's go ahead and burn off another spell slot. Go ahead and mitigate the potential damage they're about to dole out.
That's one down. Let's prep for incoming. I have to imagine we've got more than just these two left. Actually expecting that to work. Hey, nice looking out. Wow, I am not used to things going this smoothly. We're going to try to get your breath up top, flush out any other snipers. Oh shoot, I did not realize those ledges were traversable. That's actually pretty cool. Alright, so we've got three goblins on the board. Oh, hold on. Huh. I thought Istvan had more spell slots than that. You know what I did is I conflated his spells prepared with his number of spells he could cast per day. Because he could prepare six spells, I assumed he could cast six spells but it hasn't actually worked that way since 3rd edition, which is quite a ways back. Well, I should uh, really use those spell slots more sparingly. Not bad. In retrospect, I may have underestimated the strength of cantrips. I was sure. Eh, good effort. Don't beat yourself up. Okay, so this guy basically has to drop down, and that's going to be in one of these spaces here. So let's go ahead and prep for that. Oh, so close. <laughs> but it looks like that did give him second thoughts about his charge. Alright guys, we gotta wrap this up.
Thank you, sir. Very nice. And there's our tutorial on short rests, which we pretty much covered back in episode one, I want to say. That aside, uh, we're actually in really good shape. We didn't take any hits that fight. Where did those goblins come from? Some hole in the mountain, I guess. Interesting. I suppose in retrospect, uh, I really should have gone into caution mode as soon as our guys detected that strange smell. That might have let us get a bit closer before the fight actually started. I could have also had uh, Yavreth hurl a few hand axes, which would have made things slightly easier. But we don't have any backup, so she would have had to go pick them up again afterwards. I wonder if they have the returning enchantment in 5th edition. All right, we are pretty much out of time. Oh, look at that. Footprints. Probably goblins. They look quite fresh. I've never actually had a tracker in my party before. That is pretty neat. Wow, it uh, looks like the goblins did literally come from a hole in the mountain. Way to call it, Henrik. Okay, well, um, we're out of time. And it looks like we've got a bit of a detour here anyway, so we'll go ahead and hit the pause button for now, but we will pick up here next time. Oh, but you know what we can do is take a quick peek at that book we found earlier. I just realized we never actually cracked it open. You guys know me. I do love reading random lore objects. Draft for Biography Memories of a Shadow Tamer by A. Merton 1022 AC They were only a handful brave explorers, the first ever since the fall to cross the mountains to the old empire. Their names? Kay, Annie, Betty, Arwen, Swen, Rihanna, Hector. Together they were stronger than the monsters of the Badlands. Long before the Copperhead Road was found, they knew the paths and tunnels from Mazgarth to Manicolin. They brought back an old book, teaching how to enchant primed weapons, and sold it to a dwarf lord of the Gorm's Daughter clan. That was the start of it all. Soon all eyes turned to the Badlands. The thirst for the forgotten secrets of the old empire was growing. The rest is scribbled. Interesting. A. Merton. Well, given the relative positioning, I think it's safe to assume that Annie here is the uh, scavenger we talked to back in town. Not sure about the rest of these guys, though. I am somewhat jealous that they had a seven-man party, though. And here we are, stuck with just four. I will say, the uh, date is interesting, because AC stands for After Cataclysm. That seems to imply that over a thousand years passed before anyone tried to make a concerted effort towards exploring the Badlands. At any rate, uh, like I said, I think we're at a pretty good stopping point here, so we will hit the pause button for now, but we will pick up here next time. As we venture into the dreaded Goblin Hole... We are a bit light on spells, but I think we can handle a few goblins. 
See you then. Oh, and remember, although I do love playing Celesta, Crown of the Magister, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official YouTube and Twitch channels, the official social media feeds, or the official store pages. As always, links are in the description.